Hi, and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Um, so earlier this week, we recorded a wine-raging discussion with Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford University's Center for Evidence-Based Medicine and his colleague Tom Jefferson, um, covering all sorts of aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will be publishing that shortly. But uh, yesterday evening, uh, news broke of a discovery that Professor Hennigan had made in the statistics, so we thought we'd quickly catch up with him uh, and hear about that beforehand. Professor Hennigan, thanks for doing this. You're welcome. So this concerns deaths and the, the numbers of deaths that are attributed to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and this matters because that daily total that is, that is announced for deaths in England um, affects the whole atmosphere. Uh, it affects whether people think that the pandemic is coming to an end or not. Uh, it even affects politics. For example, it's referred to by Nicola Sturgeon and neighboring countries as to wh what border arrangements should be. Um, you discovered that that daily death total may not actually correlate to people dying from COVID-19. Tell us about that. Yeah, one of the things about England and particularly UK is it's quite confusing when you look at the different ways deaths are reported. You've got Office for National Statistics, you've got Public Health England, and then you've got NHS England. Then you've got the four devolved nations who all do slightly different things. So it's it's very confusing. But one of the things that we noticed is Public Health England creates lots of confusion because one day, for instance, on the 6th of July, they'll report 16 deaths. And then the next day, there'll be 152 deaths. And at that point, the media takes a, a notice, starts to get concerned, and you see these reports of hundreds of deaths per day. So what we did is go back and look at the Office for National Statistics, who report the deaths who are registered. So when you go to the register your death, that death certificate is then centrally registered. So they're very accurate about the day they occurred. And what we noticed, if you go back, for instance, to the 30th of June, the PHE figures, Public Health England, are about double the ONS figures. So we ask questions of what's going on here. And what we noticed is, if you look at the way PHE does their reporting, they are reporting anybody who has had a test positive for COVID in the past. Therefore, a, a death reported today could have occurred in, could have, the COVID could have occurred in early March. It may not even be related, but the way they're recording it, it assumes that people are thinking, oh, there are over 100 deaths today. Things are getting worse. Now, it's interesting in the devolved nations like Northern Ireland and Scotland. Could I, could I just, just to, so I really understand this. So if, if an individual patient had COVID-19 in March, Correct. recovered completely, was subsequently tested negative, and then died in a nursing home three months, two months later, that would then be recorded as a COVID-19 death. That is what we assume is happening from Public Health England, and that's where the disparity is coming from, the wide variation. Interestingly, if you look at Scotland and Northern Ireland, they have a sort of 28-day cutoff period. And that's exactly what we're asking for. What you really want to know is what are the deaths occurring in the context of an actual test that has occurred, a positive test in the last 28 days. And then you can uh, then you can understand the trends, what's happening. And OK, it's OK to report the historical deaths, but actually they don't help us understand what's happening now. Now, this will get increasingly confusing as we go into the next winter, because you could have a new outbreak new deaths, but you're also reporting historical deaths. We may not see that trend in the way that they're currently reporting this. So you mean if, if, if someone had COVID-19 now, recovers, and then dies of something completely unrelated next year, yes. that would still be recorded as a COVID-19 death in the current yeah. system? Yeah, and that's why we're saying it looks like you can never recover under the current system because you could die of influenza, for instance, in January next year. But because you had a positive COVID test, you'd still appear in the figures. Now, that creates a real problem for us as epidemiologists because then we get confused, but not least the media is getting confused. So one of the key aspects we're asking here is for some clarity in terms of how we actually do this and some joined up thinking between ONS NHS England and Public Health England. So you get one emerging data set that's consistent. So if they fix this, which kind of we hope they will, I, I understand that in Sweden, there's a similar method for counting uh, COVID-19 deaths, but there's a 31 day 
kind of elapsing period. Um, and also, I think many states in America count them in the same way as well. Um, are you are you even happy then, though? I mean, if oh. if there is a if there's a sort of period where the 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 fact of a COVID nineteen infection is counted on the death certificate, and that elapses after say a month, do you do you think we've then got accurate death numbers? Yeah. So there are two distinct issues you're getting to: is the immediate cause, and the immediate cause means you've had COVID, and we suggest that actually that's within twenty one days because that gives you a time where you've probably still not recovered and you're in hospital and you died. Outside of that, it tends to be an underlying cause. It contributed to your death, but it wasn't the direct cause of your death. And actually a 21 day cutoff would be helpful because it would give us a clearer understanding of that distinction of immediate versus underlying cause of death. But there's, have you, I mean, I spoke to a GP um, personally who said uh, that you know, he's he was going around certifying deaths in um, old people's homes, and you know he was encouraged to put COVID nineteen on the death certificate if he wasn't sure. So you have a you know an elderly person with dementia who has some sniffles or whatever, and then they say, well, maybe that was COVID nineteen. Should we be worried that even beyond this technical problem that could be fixed, there might be inflation of COVID nineteen numbers more generally? Yeah, and that's important to remember that when we have influenza outbreaks, we never test people and we put influenza on the death certificate because of what's circulating at the time. And there tends to be that conflation and an inflation in effect because you the, the sort of bias is in you is that at that moment in time, the most likely cause if you have a fever is COVID. That's one of the issues that you see the deaths in ONS are higher than both sets of data in NHS England and Public Health England. And it's contributing to some of more of the confusion, if you like. And I think this is incredibly important because what we follow then is the excess deaths. And that's the, the, the most accurate piece of information that can tell you what's going on at that moment in time. It can't tell you, though, what them excess deaths are actually caused by. And we're starting to see reports that some of them in the home setting, for instance, are a consequence of people not coming forward with heart attacks. And that's really important to understand that bit of information because what we know now is in the last three weeks, the excess deaths are, in, are actually come down below the average for three weeks in a row. But now that the hospitals are more open as well, so people are going to hospital again. It yeah, but not in the same numbers. We're still not back to normal. We've still got this reticence. And I think it's across the board as we look at like going back to the office. People are still concerned, still worried and anxious about going to hospital because they perceive they're going to get COVID when they go into hospital. That's why it's incredibly important. We have accurate figures that we can portray to the public to say this is exactly what's going on today, as opposed to what we see is sometimes in the media. It's going up. There are hundreds of deaths. Things are getting worse when we look at the data and say, actually, that's inaccurate. And we don't use the Public Health England data to understand the trend. Isn't what's difficult about this, and I think why people will probably be arguing about this for years to come, is that so many of these uh, individuals are very elderly, uh, and many of them are in um, care homes. And you know, if you, there were huge push to test everybody in care homes, but people also die all the time in care homes for obvious reasons. Um, and when you're dealing with such old um, people, you know, it's going to always be hard, isn't it, to sort of disaggregate if someone test positive for COVID-19, but then is sadly at the end of their life, what actually is the cause of death? So there's an important distinction, the difference between life lost and life years lost. And one of the issues we'll be watching very closely over the next six months is to watch how many people would have actually died in the next six months. And so their deaths were brought forward by COVID because they were vulnerable but actually their deaths, were sh their lives were shortened by a few months. And that's where the excess death calculations really matter. And if we see it significantly trending under now for the next three to four months, we'll start to come forward with information that suggests, yes, exactly, there was a group of vulnerable people who are actually any respiratory infection, could have been influenza, could have been COVID, uh, would actually have shortened their life by a few months. 
Mm. What's interesting and important about this is that actually it's looking like about 50% of the deaths are related to care homes, either directly in care homes or those people who are admitted to hospital. In places like Spain, it's as high as 70%. So the number one mitigation strategy should be to shield care homes. And there should be real thought about how to do that really well, because yes, you've just nailed it on that. They're the most vulnerable to this infection. And it seems to be once you're over 85, it really is, uh, uh, has a big impact on mortality in that age group. When, when I read your um, analysis yesterday, the reason my heart sank, because I thought, you know, if we can't even trust the, the death numbers that are coming out from Public Health England every day, you know, it, it's going to make conspiracy theorists of us all in the end, because, you know, it seems like the tilt on all of these things, if there is room for error, and of, of course it's difficult, it always seems to tilt in the direction of making the numbers look worse rather than look better. We, we haven't had these kind of ambiguities in the other direction so much. And it's it, it gives the impression that the kind of the structures are all pointing in one way. I mean, do you feel that? Yeah, so that's an important issue that's going on in the media. The sort of, you'll always hear about the catastrophe and the consequences of that. One of the things we notice is when you don't hear about something, there's probably good news happening. So when Sweden looks worse, you hear about it. But when it's not so bad, like now, you never see it in the media. But I think there are two issues that are really important. One is, out of this pandemic, I think we need a joined up thinking about how statistics are produced within this country and across the UK because of the devolved nations. And that will help us understand what's going on, particularly this issue about immediate causes of death. We're having the same problem with testing as well. We're never quite sure if somebody's been admitted with COVID or got COVID while they were in hospital. And we can't understand that bit piece of data. So that's one. The second is it's incredibly difficult to compare across countries as well, because deaths are all collected and collated in different ways. Simple things like the age reporting is different, for instance. We wanted to compare England, for instance, death rates to Ireland. And Ireland has a much younger population than England. So you can you can look at that and think, how can we compare? What would have happened in Ireland if we'd have had an age structure like that? We couldn't do it because they report their age bands differently to England. So we need joined up thinking internationally as well so we can make clear comparisons. So at the moment, you see this problem of we're doing worse or better than this country. But actually, we look at it and go, it's really difficult to tell that given the way the current reporting happens. And, and, you know, to conclude this, then, that central number, which is the basis of all international comparisons, it's the basis of a whole, our whole understanding of this, which is how many people have died, we can't necessarily have confidence in, because the Public Health England number we now know seems to be including people who have recovered. The ONS number, which is, comes out of death certificates, seems to be including some people who may not have had it, but certainly people who had might have died of other things and just had it at the time. And then if we look at the excess death number, that includes people who might have died for other reasons, like not going to hospital. So we don't, you know, is it fair to say that the actual COVID-19 death number is likely to be lower than any of those official numbers? Yeah, so, so there are two things. One thing we follow, which has been incredibly helpful, is what NHS England have done. And in doing it, they made a change to report the date of the death. And when we look at that in hospitals now, we're looking at about an average of about 19 deaths per day. And that's slightly coming down because I'm referring back to about five days ago when it's stabilised. So each day they report, but they could go back five days in time. So NHS England is the best data set to understand the trend. They account for 60 percent of the deaths. ONS is useful, but the problem with ONS is we have to go back about 10 days and wait till Tuesday for it to report. So we can't accurately tell you what's going on today, but we can tell you what was going on 10 days ago. So those are the two data sets we use. And I tend to not pay attention to PHE because of this problem with the way the data is reported and the variation from day to day. And, and the, the ones that you do use, you feel confident in that, that at least are a reasonable reflection of COVID-19 deaths. Yeah and, one of our, yeah, and one of my jobs is, and our team's job is, to tell you whether it's coming down or very sensitively, when do we think it's going up? 
And soon as it's going up, we would inform and say, look, we think the trend's going in the opposite direction. It is still coming down. It has slowed slightly, but it's still going in the right direction. And that's an important distinction because we also want to be able to say, oh, maybe there's a second phase of an outbreak. It's changing in the opposite direction. And that's really important to, to have that distinction within our ability to understand the trends. Carl Hennigan, thank you so much for uh, paying close attention to these things. And uh, there's more of you coming up later. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Professor Carl Hennigan just clearing up uh, what he's found out about um, the ambiguities around Public Health England deaths. Uh, so thanks for that. You'll be hearing more from him and Tom Jefferson later today.